JP is going to go through here today. He's he's going to build the Action DAP in ReachLang. You can uh, set that up by going to reach.sh, and they have the installation documents there. Almost ready. Good. All right. Looking good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, we are we're having so much fun here. We're, I'm, I'm I'm so glad that you guys are here. This is. <laughs> This is great. Uh, here at the second annual Decipher Conference here, uh, I haven't heard where it's going to be next year, but I hope that all of you will come and join us wherever in the world we get to go. We've had a great time here in Dubai. It's my first time, so thank you for having me, Dubai. This was awesome. All right. This is a lovely, lovely venue. Thank you to everybody who has come out, uh, flown from all over oh, the I globe. I can't remember, there were like 60 different okay, countries that's where we came from. That's just, that's just incredible. Um, looks like we are getting closer, so I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just keep going on, right? Um, let's see here. What else? I'm 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 I will tell you. I'm I'm getting a little tired. Who's who's been watching the World Cup out there, right? Uh, the pretty exciting stuff going on. Did your team win last night? Okay. All right. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm show my and, so is, are any this. of your teams uh, still still playing? Are you ready to go through into the knockout rounds here upcoming? Very exciting stuff. And uh, let's see here. What else? What what else have we got going on there? Uh, so thanks to everybody who's been here on the Tech Talk stage in the greenhouse over the last couple of days. I'm looking out there. I see Zeph. Man, wasn't it wasn't it great to see him out there just showing us how to, how to build. Uh, using using Pi Teal in his example of the of the uh, of, of the tallest your your favorite tallest building out there that was that was kind of a fun example, and uh, right JP is going to make it difficult on himself here. All right, here we go. All right, well we're having fun. Um, so. Uh, How's it going, JP? What do you think? I think we're here. You're gonna you're, 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 you're gonna do it that way. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do it the hard way, All right. cowboy way. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Mr. JP Miller from Reach is gonna build us an auction Wait, damp. Uh huh. Well, here we go. Okay. I, I, w I wish I could moonwalk, but I can't. Let's Take it. it away, All JP. All right, thank you, Ryan. Welcome. How's everyone doing? All right. <laughs> I'm JP Miller with Reach, and let's see, where is my slideshow at? Here it is. There we go. Okay, with DevX, so I'm the director of DevX at Reach. Yeah, you might know Nick Stanford. He's our local hero. You've got me today. It's my LinkedIn. If you want to connect, say hello. So at Reach, is, uh, we, we want to solve the question of how can I build dApps quickly and safely? It doesn't take me months to learn. And Reach is our solution. So Reach is a high-level Web3 programming language that is a, also a compiler, a verification engine, and a deployment tool. It looks and feels like JavaScript, so it's easy for a full-stack developer to get up and started. We're able to train full-stack developers in about six weeks and have them ready for a job in about eight weeks after they've built a program shown some experience. So one thing I'd like to highlight before we actually get into the code, I'm going to get into the text editor and, and show you some code. I was hoping to uh, like code it out here, but I, I don't know how that will work. So we're going to maybe just go block by block. But before we get into the code, it's wise to st stop and think about the problem that you want to solve. So we're building an NFT auction, and we're actually going to do two apps today. Because reach programs, they're high level and they're so compact. We have the time in 50 minutes, and maybe 40 minutes to allow time for questions to go through two quick apps. And we want to think about these problems. So one problem is, like, how can I mint NFTs? And how can I do that with reach? And then the other problem is, how can I serve those NFTs in an auction so I can sell my NFTs or I can allow other users to sell their NFTs and allow bidders to bid on them? And then you want to think about, like, Who's all involved in this process? Who are my participants? You know, there's going to be an auctioneer or a seller of the item. There's going to be bidders or someone who's minting an NFT. You know, are they the same people? Are they different people? 
You know, think through all of, all of those problems and, and all of your actors who are going to be participating in your application. And you want to start thinking about the, the flow of the app, the logic of that application. Right? And these are all important things to answer, questions to answer, before we actually start building the application. Oftentimes the temptation is just to get right in and start coding and, you know, without like a framework or like really thinking through the control flow of the program, we can get ourselves in trouble midway through. So if you'd like to follow along or if you'd like to look at the code base, there's a QR code to the GitHub repository. For this first one, we'll look at the, the NFT Minter. All right, let me pull this up. So I think actually what we can do here is pull that over here and grab this one over there. We're just playing musical chairs. It's not just a kid's game. I guess this is musical windows without the music. Okay, cool. And then over here, we'll just go, where are you at? There we go. Blow that up a bit. Maybe a little more. Okay, cool. All right, so our first program here is an NFT minter. I want to be able to mint an NFT, and I want to build my own NFT minter. So how could I do that with Reach? This is actually an interesting program because we won't actually use any of the back end reach. This is, we can do all this in the front end with IPFS. So like I said, I'm going to pull this in a few blocks at a time. We'll walk through the program in blocks. And we'll, we'll look at it together. So the first things I do, this is uh, front end. I'm going to import my reach and I'm importing a test framework. And then I'm also importing IPFS. And, um, and then I'm just setting up a, a constant standard library so I can easily call my standard library, right? Which is just a, a library, just like an analog library, is a collection of functions to make our life easier as developers. All right, and I want to be able to connect to a wallet because this is Web3. It's not your keys. It's not your, it's not your NFT in this case. So I want to connect to a wallet, and we can do that with a set wallet fallback. And you'll notice on line six there, the provider environment, testnet. So there's a clue here that we're going to deploy to testnet. If I wanted to make this a real application when I was done testing it, and I want to go to mainnet, we're often asked the question of how can I deploy my reach app onto mainnet? And it is literally as easy as doing this right there. And now your app will go to mainnet, and it's as Okay, but we'll leave it at testnet for now. And then we'll set up our, our accounts. There are different ways you can set up accounts. Today we're going to use a method called new account from mnemonic. It just grabs the 25 word mnemonic from an Algorand wallet, um, my algo in this case. And we're assigning one to a minter and one to a receiver. So we're going to, in this we're going to mint an NFT and then we're going to transfer it from the minter to a recipient. And I'm just giving the minter and receiver debug tags so that when we test this in the terminal, instead of seeing AGF134, we see minter and we see receiver, right? So we have uh, something that looks human readable instead of an address. All right, then we'll format our tokens. So contracts want to, in the blockchain, they want to read tokens in um, atomic units. So it'd be like counting all of your dollars as pennies, right? And humans don't really like that as much. We don't want to think about like $10,000 in terms of pennies. And so we, we format the currency. This is for our humans so that they can read the currency easily. And then we just set up a a little helper function in the skip bell that explains the uh, who has a token and what the balance is. And so this will show the balance of the token. 
and let's see, it goes over a little bit. So this just is waiting for the standard, the balance of, from the standard library and who is the account and the token, and then we um, are formatting the balance so that it's human readable. All right, then one more helper function here to log our balance, and we'll, we'll walk through this together. So this function log balance is an asynchronous function that takes an account, it sets a token as false, so token in this case is a non-network token, which we refer to an NFT in this case. Uh, a network token would be like your algo and then any other tokens under the algo blockchain be considered non-network tokens, so NFTs. And this just grabs a balance and the unit to track if it's a token, if there's a token there, then it shows how many there are of the NFT. Otherwise, it'll show us how many algos we have. And it returns that information. All right, the last thing here is we'll just wait our log balance for the mentor. So now we're going to grab the balance of the mentor, see how much that mentor has when they start. Okay. So now we'll, we'll begin to a uh, couple global constants just to set up our, our NFT. So and I imagine this is a, a JPAL. If you have one of these JPALs, then you're a friend of JP, and the symbol is a JPS. Right? All right, so this will be our, the name of our, N, our NFT. And then we start setting up our, our, IP, our IPFS. So before you know, this, I went to, uh, I created a little image, I put it up on IPFS, and I got a CID, right, and, and uh, I did that with, what, uh, NFT storage. And so we just set this up. And all this, this bit of code all came from IPFS's documentation. So uh, setting up the accounts node, awaiting the IPFS, and calling their create method. And then we want our NFT to be ARC69 compatible. So I went to the ARC69 documentation and grabbed these parameters. So this is the supply, there's, there's one of these. This is the CID address from uh, NFT storage. So I got that from IPFS. And then we have a clawback value, a freeze address, and then we can set our ARC69 token to, have a, to be default frozen. If that were true, then we wouldn't be able to transfer the token. And then we can also reserve it, and we could add a node if we wanted to. All right, so this sets up the options for our NFT. Grab a function for getting the IPFS data. So previously, as I mentioned, I put this image on in some way, right? So, and again, this came from IPFS documentation. Um, so I get the IPFS data, set up a stream and a decoder, and then I just set up this 408, and all this um, was, was almost directly from IPFS. I just needed to add it in this new data because reach doesn't allow for uh, increments, so I couldn't do like a plus equals with reach, so we just set up a, a new data let and add that in there. All right, so this will get our IPFS, and then I can do a console log. If I were to, uh, I could, you know, remove that, and it would show me, like, the, the metadata of the NFT, and it's not human readable. So we'll spare ourselves that and just leave it commented out. And this will return that data so it's accessible for us. We can interact with that. All right, so now we're ready to mint our NFT. So we'll go back. Our reach standard library code. We'll mint our NFT. So this function mints an NFT. It address the name, so this would be JPAL, the symbol, JPS of, of our NFT, and all those options that we set up earlier. And then we uh, let our user know that we're minting the NFT. Set up the NFT constant, which launches the token. This launch token is a reach standard library method. It will launch our token for us. It, it mints it. And then we return the ID, because we'll need that for the transfer. 
All right, and then now our NFT will be minted. We're ready to set up our transfer function. So this will be for our transfer. Again, we're grabbing those addresses, the from address, the to address, the NFT ID, ID, and the supply, the amount of the, the NFTs, which will be one. All right, and then we wait for the receiver, token accept. This token accept is a method that we need to use with Algorand that allows a, an address, the receiver, to opt in to accept the token. Because we have to opt into addresses before we can accept a token. We let our user know that the receiver opted into the NFT. And then we'll transfer it over. And then we just show that uh, the NFT was transferred. And uh, we show, and we also have a test. So line 73 here is from our test method where we imported the test at that first line. And we're just proving that the amount of the NFTs before is the amount of the NFTs after. So there should be one and one. Our last thing that we'll do is call all of our functions. So we set them up, now we wanna call them. Okay, so this line one on line 76, we'll call the IPFS data to get that data. 77, mints the NFT. Set line 78, transfers from the minter to the receiver. And then we show the minter's balance and we exit. If we didn't have line 80, that process exit, then the program would just hang. It, it does nothing, right? So at this point, we're ready to run. So let me get my terminal. Where is that? OK, let's blow that up. And we're going to do, in this case, we'll do an NPM start. So this is all run with Node. So in the background, I set up, I, um, set up my package JSON and set up the IPFS and all that. And if you grab that QR code, you'll see that in the repository. So we get the swarm that's, that's listening to IPFS. It's getting the IPFS data, minting the NFT. We can see the NFT information there, so we've minted our JPL. The, the minter has one of the NFTs, and then the receiver opts in, so this is where they accept the token. And then we transfer the token from the minter to the receiver, and now the receiver has one of the NFTs. And then we see a successful test, and now the minter has 9.957 algo, and at the top they had 9.9. Five, nine. Right on. So we've minted an NFT and we've done that with the Reach Standard Library and we did all of that in 91 lines. Um, and I think on this, this program was 80 lines of code. So not too shabby. All right. So now let's have some fun. We've got an NFT. Let's put it up for auction and make some money off of it, right? So let's get that set up. So if you'd like to look at that code, that would be here. While you do that, I'll get this set up. Okay. Okay, and we just want to pull this one over here. Okay, so Let's program some reach. Let's, let's build a reach code. So this is, this is, now we'll get into reach, the back end, the index.rsh, which is your reach shell. So this auction, let's just like think about it for 30 seconds. Um, we're gonna have an auction. We want a, uh, an auctioneer, someone to start the auction, and we want bidders. So the auctioneer, we're gonna call them a participant. They're actually gonna launch the application and put it on the blockchain. And then we're gonna want bidders and our bidders are gonna be APIs. And we'll talk about that, but APIs are essentially front end users, front end clients that are pinning the back end, that are they're communicating to the contract and saying, I want to bid on this NFT item. And then we we'll wanna set up something called a parallel reduce where we get into a race. We wanna race one another to win this item, to win this NFT. Um, and so our, 
our logic is going to be that, okay, we're going to have an auctioneer or someone to start the auction, and then we're going to say, okay, the auction is ready. And then all the bidders are going to bid on that NFT. And they're going to race one another to win the NFT until the time, so there will be a deadline. And once the time is up, then no one else can bid on it, and we'll announce who the winner is. So this is like, roughly speaking, you know, like 45 seconds. That'll be the logic of our program. So the first thing we always do is we start with the version of, of the language. So in this case, reach 0.1. And then we're going to set up our, our initialization. So we're going to uh, set up our creator. So let's see here. All right, so app initialization, we're going to set up our participant interact interface. We've got a creator. They're a participant, and we've named them as creator. And they've got a function called get sale. So they're going to grab the NFT ID. They're going to identify the minimum bid amount and set up how many blocks they want the auction to last for. And then they'll call an auction ready, a C bid, and a C outcome. And you'll see that we have types next to each of the method names. So every function here, every method has a type. So auction ready, for example, is a function that has no input and has no output. C bid is a function that takes in a tuple of an address and an unsigned integer and has no output. Uh, get sale is a function that has no input but outputs an object. And the object contains three fields, the NFT ID, the minimum bid, and the length and blocks. And when we start building our front end, the back end is going to reflect the front end. So all of these functions that creator has in the back end, they'll have, will name the same functions in the front end. And so when you're building a reach application, you only need to track two files in your mind, the back end and the front end, which makes your app development much faster and less complicated. This is easy to keep two things in your mind, where it can be harder if you, if you need to track over multiple files. All right, the next thing we'll do is set up a bidder. Not bad there. So we'll try it again. Okay, so we'll set up a bidder. There we go. And our bidder is an API. And let's see, I have a slide about this, so. Uh, an API is a a front end that wants to communicate with a back end. And what it's going to allow us to do is for any client is going to be able to call that contract and say, I want to call this bid function. So let's, let's build that. Um, so we set up the bidder, and they have one function, bid. Uh, this bid is a function that takes an unsigned integer. This will be the, the amount that the bidder is willing to pay. And it'll output a tuple, their address and an unsigned integer. And then we we'll also have that const v is a information that you don't need to be connected to a wallet to see. Anyone could go to uh, Algo Explorer and look at that information in the Block Explorer, but we're just going to make that easy so you don't have to go to Block Explorer because you can do that or, or be interested in doing that. And then the last thing we'll do is initialize our application. And uh, we don't want to infinity it. I'm not sure what that fun Sometimes VS Code can be uh, very persistent. This takes us out of app initialization mode and puts us in the first step or the first state of our application. All right, so we'll give our creator the first thing to do. So the way Reach works is you, you work in steps in different states of your application. And so the creator is going to be in their local step in this only. So only the creator is going to create this constant, this object that contains the NFT, the minimum bid, the length and blocks. And they're going to declassify and interact with the get sale function. So interact and declassify is 
So this is how the interact right there is how we'll move between the back end and the front end. So in the front end, we're going to define get sale. And that get sale is going to have some information inside of it. And it's going to do something. And when we call it in the back end, it, Interact allows us to essentially like middleware, go from the back end server, the blockchain, right, to the front end, to the client. All right, and then we'll publish this information. And to publish information is to put it onto the blockchain. So now it's publicly available. So once it's published, you could go to Algo Explorer and you could see this information in the block explorer. And so we're publishing all the information inside of that object. And we're going to set up an amount and then we'll commit that information. So set up an amount to one. There's one NFT. All right, we're going to commit. And that commit takes us out of a consensus step and puts us back in in the step. So we're moving to a new state. Okay. Bring in four more lines here. And the next thing we'll do is pay. So we're going to pay our contract. So the thing that I like to think about when I'm thinking, okay, what can a blockchain app be useful for? What is a dApp useful for? Is to lower the cost of verification. Right? So I have to think like, well, blockchains are expensive, all the gas fees, et cetera. You know, it's slow. Like, how are you going to lower the cost of verification? You mean like lower gas fees? And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the verification. So here we're building an auction. We're essentially, we're building uh, a robot auctioneer. Whereas in the analog world and in our, like, in our real life, if we were going to, and maybe you've been to an auction, so you, you've experienced this. You know, you have an auctioneer, you have like a big auction house, there's a name behind the auctioneer. They're certified, they're licensed, they're bonded. Uh, they've you know, paid insurance companies to say that they are like the truth and they are honest and then they got all this reputation behind them. They've got marketing and branding and they'll spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, large auctioneer organization or like a franchise. They'll spend millions of dollars to produce verification, to say you can trust us as auctioneers and we can come and hold an estate sale for you or we can sell things from your business or whatever it might be and you can trust us and they spend millions of dollars to create this verified trust and here we're doing it for 0.001 algo or even on an expensive network like on ethereum where your gas fees are fifty dollars fifty dollars compared to millions of dollars is still very cheap and so we're lowering the cost of verification and, and i said all that to say that we're paying the contract. So the contract is going to hold the NFT in escrow. So we don't need an auction house to hold our NFT in, uh, in escrow. We're just going to put it in the smart contract. And that's what line 30 does. Okay, and then the creator is going to say, I'm ready. The auction is ready. Let's go. And you see lines 32 and 33 are views so the v.nft.set. This is the pattern that we use to create a view, so it's uh, view dot the field dot set and NFT ID, the argument. So we're showing the NFT ID and we're going to show the minimum bid. And this way anyone can hop on our app and they would be able to see, oh, this NFT is at uh, 20 algo. Like, okay, I know I need a bid at least 21 algo if I'm, if I'm going to be in the running for this. All right, then we're going to assert an, a, a balance. This assert is a static assertion. This is always true. So we're saying the balance of the NFT ID, which is one, is always going to be equal to the amount of the NFTs available, which is one. So we're saying one is one, and this is always going to be true. And it's ever not one is one, then we're going to display the message that the balance of the NFT is wrong. And this, what this does is it tells Reach's verification engine to pay specific, particular attention to this detail. If this math is ever incorrect, destroy the contract.
Okay, and then we'll set up our end at our, our end parameter. So cast to end, we will end the auction after the, the last consensus time function plus the length of blocks. So this will set up our end, and we're going to use end to uh, get out of our while loop that we're going to create. So now we're going to begin to create a parallel reduce. So parallel reduce is a race. And uh, whether you know it or not, you've been participating. Uh, parallel reduce is a reduction. And you've, you've learned about reductions back in first grade. When you did 1 plus 1 equals 2, that is a reduction. So I have a slide about that. Here it is. So a parallel reduce is simply a reduction. And we're just reducing event input events. So these API calls are input events. And they're going to race one another to try to win this NFT item. And, but only one can win. And so what the parallel reduce does is it does the heavy lifting for us to decide which bidder is, takes which priority. Right? So we know that if a bid comes in and, and then a second bid comes in five minutes later, it's easy to say what the priority is. It can be harder if this was a popular item and people around the world are bid on this. That could be very challenging to decide, okay, which address takes which priority. And the parallel reduce does this for us and it will manage the, the state of the API calls. <clears throat> All right, so line 36, we set up our constants, our highest bidder the last price of the auction, and is it the first bid, which is a Boolean. We set up our parallel reduce. You'll see creator starts at the highest bidder. The minimum bid is the original last price, and is first bid is true. And then define is a method that comes with a parallel reduce that allows us to show this view of the current bid. And then we're going to set up an invariance. So invariance... Um, I'll say it like this, that the, the verification engine is not able to like see what happens inside of a parallel reduce. It's kind of a black box to the verification engine. So what we can do is set up an invariant and the verification engine can track the invariance. So the invariant will st is established just before the loop. So I don't know, if, you know, we'll see that in a second if you missed it. And then the condition in the body of the loop must always validate the invariant by the time we get to continue, by the time we get to the end of the loop. And when the, when the while loop closes, the invariant must still be true. So essentially we're saying this is a dynamic assertion that as we go into the loop, this thing will always be true when you're in the loop or by the time that we're at the end of the loop and we, start either, we either start a new loop or we exit it. And this tells that verification engine to watch this math. And so we're setting up an invariant on the balance of the NFT ID. So again, it's just saying that 1 equals 1. And then line 42 there is the invariant of our balance. So is it the first bid? And if it is, then it's 0. Otherwise, it's the last bid. And that's going to be the balance. And then we start our while loop. And we're in this while loop while the last consensus time is less than the end. Where's my mouse here? There we go. Okay. All right, now we'll set up an API. So this is going to allow our bidder to do what they want to do, which is to bid and win. So our API block, it goes from 44 to 55 there. It sets up our bidder. So we're calling that bid method within the bidder. And we're, first we're doing a check. So this check is a, a dynamic assertion that says inside of this block that the, the bid must be greater than the last price. Otherwise, we're going to say, hey, your bid is too low. And we'll return that bid. We'll notify the highest bidder and the last price. And if it's not the first bid, if we're, we're going to end it, then we're going to transfer the last price to the highest bidder. In other words, if no one buys the item, then we're gonna just going to send that back to the creator. Otherwise, we'll ignore it. And we're setting up who to this, and then we're interacting with a C bid. So we're calling that C bid and saying who made the bid and how much it was for. And this return statement 
that who bid in false, that matches right here at the top this, in this parallel reduce, this creator. And so everything in, in reach is, um, once you set, you notice we use a lot of cons. We don't use any vars. And in, in the RSH file, we don't use lets because information is immutable. Once we publish something to, or we publish data to the blockchain, it's immutable. We can't change it. So how do we update things like in a loop? So the problem would be like once I get into a loop, I'm either going to be in the loop forever or I'm actually not going to be able to access that loop, right, because information is immutable. So the parallel reduce, when we return, this is able to modify those parameters. So the, the new highest bidder becomes the who. So I'm looking at line 36 at the very top. So the, the who, the address, the bidder, the, the highest bidder becomes the highest bidder. Kind of silly when you say it like that, but there it is. The bid amount becomes the last price. And now is first bid becomes false because it's no longer the first bid. So in other words, this NFT is no longer going to go back to the creator. And this is how within that return statement is how we're able to update variables inside the parallel reduce and how we're able to do something like a race and change information inside of the, of the reach program. All right, then we just want to set up our timeout. So we want a way to exit the loop. So set up that timeout, and this is just going to, hey, once we time out, we're going to, this is the final highest bidder, the last price, and we're going to say the, the is first bid, and we know that will be false at that point, assuming there's been at least one, uh, one bidder. And then our last block of code here. is going to set up the transfer. So this transfer amount, we're going to transfer the, um, the amount, which is one, and the ID of the NFT to the highest bidder. So in other words, the NFT is going to go to our bidder. We're going to uh, have our creator interact with our show outcome method. So this is going to show everyone who won the, who won the race. And then we're going to close out the contract. And when we close the contract, the contract exits and it destroys the contract, right? And Reach is going to make sure, the verification engine is going to make sure that the contract will exit with zero balance. It's going to make sure that we won't overspend. And it's going to make sure that our, it's going to assert that our front ends and our participants are honest. So that is the back end, and we built an entire auction in 66, 65 lines of code there. And so this, this completes the back end. And we'll go through and we'll, we'll build a, a front end. Here about, we're going to move through this, this front end portion a bit faster. So we're building this with React classes. Uh, hooks are the, the new theme. But classes, the components still work. So I said I'm going to move through the front end a little faster so I can demo it for you and have time for a couple questions. This is going to input, uh, import all, of, all the data that we need, all the React stuff, all the views, and it imports our, our standard library. And then sets a constant for our standard library. Then we're going to import a, a wallet. So this MyAlgo Connect is going to allow us to use the MyAlgo wallet. And again, we see that provider environment, testnet. So again, if I want to make this auction and put it on mainnet, how could I do that? It's as simple as changing testnet to mainnet. Okay. And then we're going to set up some standard units. Um, chance for it to go to sleep. Setting up some default amounts for bidding and the default values that will show in our view. And then we'll do some React stuff. We'll, we'll set up our properties, and we're going to mount our components. OK. OK, and then we'll just start our contract. So let's start that contract.
Uh, reach is agnostic, so we're, we're front-end agnostic. I'm doing this with React, but you could do this with Angular. Um, I'm using React classes, but you could use uh, React hooks if you wanted. You could do this with vanilla JavaScript. Reach is completely front-end agnostic. We don't really care. You could do it with Python with the RPC server. Okay, so here we're grabbing that new account from Mnemonic. This allows us to quickly grab an account that we've pre-populated with some algos so that we can play with it. And then we set our state to get the auction ready on the front end. Okay, and then last steps here, we'll set a elect our bidder. Set up the state for the bidder and return the view with the app views. All right, then we'll set up our properties for our creator. All right, so this just sets up the React component for the creator, sets up the creator's properties. We'll set things like their, their minimum address, uh, excuse me, the, the minimum bid amount. We'll set the state to view deploying, so okay, now we're gonna deploy and we, we get the contract information. So there on line uh, 52, we're getting contract information and we're gonna make that publicly viewable. So now we'll get the sale, so this looks familiar. Um, so setting up the NFT ID, the minimum bid amount, the length and blocks we're gonna to set to 30. That's about two minutes here. And then we'll start to see these functions that we made for the creator in the background, or excuse me, in the back end. So auction ready, so say, hey, this auction is ready. Set the state to true and let our uh, participants know that, our, our API members know that they can bid. All right, we'll set up a C bid so we can see the user's address and how much they bid for. And then that show outcome function. So we're just, this is the front end representation of those functions that we set up in the back end. And there's the show outcome so that everyone can see the outcome of the auction. People want to know who won. Okay, and then render the view and set it to the deployer view. All right, we got about 10 minutes left here, so, and I want to give time for questions, so I'm going to drop in the rest. It's about, it's about 30 lines here, and we'll just, we'll just walk through it. So now we set up the bidder. We set up the bidder's properties. We set their view to attach. The creator's view was deploy. The bidder's view is attach. This attach function sets up logic for uh, getting the, the accounts and setting up the currencies. And then we have a bid function here where this ties in with the bid um, and the, we call the API bidder and give them the ability to bid and their bid amount. So this ties in with the back end. And then we set the initial state for waiting for turn. So just waiting for their turn to start bidding. And we show their address as a formatted address and their bid amount as formatted currency. So it's human readable. We have our set bid method here or to show the view. So this is gonna show the view of the bid. Again, making that accessible for anyone. And then we close the app. Okay, so let's, let's see, where's the terminal at here? Okay, and we're going to use a reach react. So this allows me to quickly set up a, a front end wrapper using react. And this is going to be on localhost. So it'll set up a localhost environment where I can test this out on my test net. So we're gonna start the development server here in just a second. We should be able to 
to go to localhost 3000. So localhost 3000 is up and ready. There we go. It's up there. So let's go to my browser here. Okay. Let's start this auction. So first one's going to create and sell. We're going to set this to one algo. I will set the minimum bid and create and deploy. So we're going to deploy that. And while that's deploying, I'll open another window. Also get started. This is going to be the bidder, though. Okay, so it should be ready in just a couple seconds. There we go. So auction's not quite ready yet. Current bid is at zero. I'm going to copy that contract info. And now in my bidder's view, so this could be a whole other computer somewhere else, right? It's uh, the client. And I'm going to show that auction information. All right, I'm going to need to assign here. Okay, there's our NFT. I have the ability to bid now, so I'll start the bid. Uh, minimum bid, one algos will bid two. All right, well, let's send it. Sign my wallet. Okay, waiting for the results. Uh, we'll wait for the results there. There we go. Current bid just updated to two. So I can go back here, actually, and I can uh, refresh to pretend like I'm a new bidder. I'm another bidder in the parallel reduce. This could be someone completely different. And I'm going to make another bid. Sign our wallet here. See the NFT. We see the current bid is now at two. Let's push it to four. Bid and send it. And then we'll sign. All right, waiting for the results. Let's see. This should update to four in a second. There we go. Upstates to four. Now, what's, what would happen if I uh, try to bid three? Let's see if I can show that easily. So we'll try to sign again here. Okay. And let me bid three this time. And send it. So we won't see anything in the front end. This would be a feature that we'd want to implement. But if we go look at our console... I don't know how well this will show over there, but over here it'll say, hey, your bid was too low. So there we see that error information, bid is too low. So yeah, we would want to bid more. All right. And we should be getting close to the edge. Here we go. So the auction end ended. We see our winning address and the winning amount for algos. So NFT auction from start to finish in less than 30 minutes. There you go. JP, nice work, JP. That is awesome. Uh, do, do we have? We definitely have some time for questions, and I know we have some questions. So we're going to get the mic out there. Who's got a question? Get your hand in the air. We'll get those answered right here. Right, okay, here comes here comes the mic. Right. That was awesome. Yeah, it was fun. And, and, and it was fun to see it built in in, in two different languages, right? Yeah. See it in Python, and then see it repeated in, in Reach. Here's your question. I wanted to ask uh, about the first stage when you upload the NFT from the URL stream. Uh, there seems to be uh, an issue in the code, I believe, that you're reading a chunk of uh, bytes and uh, there seems to be a mix-up uh, yeah. that if the NFT size would be bigger than uh, the default chunk size for the text decoder, then we wouldn't uh, actually read the full NFT bytes, I believe. So in the first program where we minted the NFT? Yeah, yeah. So I believe uh, there is something that needs to be fixed. So uh, my question is how, uh, because I like the part when, uh, where Rust is uh, blockchain agnostic, as I noticed there was uh, some uh, uh, some code that is actually uh, connected to Ether logic. So uh, how do I test that? 
because on the previous presentation we had some test examples uh, that we actually have seen what's in the blockchain and if I uh, deploy that code on Ether, for example, yeah. how, do I how do I test that? Gotcha, yeah, so different blockchains have different byte sizes and different parameters for their NFTs. Use a condition, right? So we're able to check what connector, so you would set up a connector, uh, a condition based on connector. If I'm connected to Algo, use these parameters that meet the ARC69. Or if I'm connected to ETH, then use these parameters that are uh, compliant with an Ethereum NFT. And so, yeah, we just do that with a, with a condition statement. Um, but does, Rust, uh, does Reach have uh, the, uh, some kind of test framework to connect to a certain network and? Yeah, so connecting is uh, like to a different network. So find my terminal. You, you s just set it with the connector mode. So, you know, export. And then I do a reach connector mode. And I'll set it to algo if I want to be connected to Algorand. And I would, I would do ETH if I wanted to set it to something else. And then we also are connected to Conflux, which is the only blockchain that operates in China. So I can, uh, I can set connector modes just as easily as that. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions out there? Don't think I see any other. So with that, I want to thank you, JP right. Miller, showing us how this is done. Awesome. So glad to have you up here.